When Card Logistics left League World of Sudan, their bank account was boosted by a hefty sum of money from local cartels, who, mere days after their transactions with the company were done, eagerly threw their new weapons into fight to expand their operations. Some in the fleet grumbled that selling so many advanced heavy weapons to hardened criminals was a bad thing, but no one could really question monetary bonuses Mr. Cart sent to all of his crewmates. What's more, the gangs turn out to be less focused on fighting government law enforcement and more on kicking each other out of production facilities and smuggling points. All that Percy and League military had to do now was to wait a week for the gangers to kill themselves and then roll up whatever was left. And so, status quo was preserved, like it always was, and the only result was a lot of money changing hands. One could almost say that cart logistics should be rewarded for boosting local economy and, indirectly, restoring some modicum of law and order, after all the gangs blew each other up with their shiny new toys. But of course, by the time gang wars began, the company was already far away, on its way back to Galatian Academy to finally hand in their contracts. On their way, however, they decided to drop in by desert planet Asharu, first to top up on fuel, and second to give its crew a day or two of shore leave, and Asharu was a perfect place for that. Close enough to big players like Germany to deter most pirate raids, but still independent, which meant people like House, Zala or Disco could go and grab a beer in a pub without appearing on every news bulletin with words wanted dead over their heads. Mr. Cart learned with some surprise that a number of his employees used their money to buy small plots of land on a shadow, which apparently was decent enough place if one wanted to retire to a small farm and leave in peace far away from sector politics. Sure, hegemony sometimes came knocking, but usually it was just posturing. And aside from that, the world was too small and too poor to attract pirates and too backwards to annoy Ludic Path, so a perfect retirement place indeed. Granted, to Mr. Card that sentiment was something he could never understand. For him, space was where he wanted to be, and not just because his malformed body really hated being inside gravity wells. So in short, everyone expected a peaceful shore leave, but when crews started to drunkenly stagger back to the fleet, their boss immediately realized something was wrong, as Captain House called him on a private channel, and even weirder, he was sober. He explained that, as he came down to the surface, he performed his usual ritual. While his mates went out to look for a bar, he went to a bank to send most of his salary back to his family. It was a pretty impressive system he had set up. The money wasn't being sent directly to the recipient, but bounced between dozens of different servers and accounts all over the sector before finally ending up in his family's hands. Hence, by the time it did, it was pretty much untraceable. House really did his best to keep his private life private, which is why he was furious when, during the transaction, another familiar face showed up on the screen of the bank terminal. Harper, the fuck you want? House growled, as his mechanical eye turned from usual blue to menacing red. The red-headed woman on the screen smiled with her teeth, but not with her eyes. House, old boy, is that how you greet your mates now? Not even a hello? You hacked a bank terminal to talk to me, so you want something. Spit it up now so I can start looking for you to make sure you never do that again. So angry. You are always so angry, House. Probably why you look 30 years older than you really are. She winked at the pirate, who was quickly shutting down all pending transactions. He'd have to send the money from somewhere else now. Anyways, I heard you were making a name for yourself out there, with that little transport company you fly with. Which is a double surprise, considering you were supposed to never fly again. I'm not flying, Harper. My hands are never at the controls. And besides, how could I fly? My ship's gone and you bloody well know it. Yes, precisely. That's what I thought. But imagine my surprise when I heard from a little rat that your ship is actually out there flying again, and with you at the helm, no less. I feel a bit offended, really. I always wanted you to take me on a trip on Friendly Welcome, 
But you always said it's grounded. Didn't take you for a liar. Cause I'm not one, House replied flatly, his money transfer cancelled. If Harper wanted to track his money back to his family, she should have waited a few minutes longer. My ship's in Cantor's docks. I'm just here on a shadow sweeping floors and growing desert potatoes. And I'm sure you have dozens of witnesses and faked evidence that confirm it. But don't bother, old man. I know you were out there because you brought a little rat named Martin back to the core. I'm impressed, really. You turned into a bona fide good Samaritan in your old age. What's next? A charity business? Oh, maybe an orphanage. I should have tossed the little shit out of the airlock when I had the chance. Let me guess, he came running straight to you. No. Stupid bastard thought he could demand an audience with Kanta herself. He insisted upon it. Might expect how it went. Got his arms and legs chopped off, half of his organs cut out for the market, and got tossed into the pit. But it just so happened I was on pit duty that day. So I talked to him before he bled out and learned oh so many things about you and your ghost fleet. Oh, I also learned that good old Shannon is still out there, so that's a bonus for me. She's no longer flying, Harper. We killed her. Yes, that's what you told the rats, so I assumed you were lying. And Kanta was oh so happy to learn that her wayward captain was still out there. I can't wait for a reunion. Hope you'll come along too, we can reminisce about your prime days. I'll pass. Now can you stop with your fucking rambling and get to the point where you blackmail me? You didn't hack this terminal just to be sassy. Oh come on, you're just no fun at all, old man. Besides, don't you always have those long, winding talks with your marks before you scare them into submission? Well, since I learned it from you, I thought it would be an enlightening experience for you to be on the receiving end for once. House went silent. If the woman wanted to see him squirm, she couldn't be more of the mark. The old pirate just scowled at her across the screen, unwilling to give her the satisfaction. Ruff? Very well then, blackmail it is. I have something I need delivering to a system few days away from the core. That something is valuable enough that at least two governments and three dozen warlords are willing to kill me for it. And since they're circling like vultures around me, I decided it's time to stash it somewhere. You, on the other hand, really do not want me to tell Kanda you stole back your ship. Impressive show, by the way, she still has no idea. So you're gonna be delivering this stuff for me. And yes, there's plenty of people who will no doubt look out for it, so make sure you ghost fleet your way through them. Or kill all of them, I don't care. Hell, I even feel that some of your Samaritan vibes rub off on me, so I'll even pay you for it. How great is that, eh? Not really. If you're willing to pay, you probably don't expect us to come back. Possibly. Or maybe I just want to see if you're really as good as people out there say you are. Cause you can bet this is not the last time I'm blackmailing you. Ah, uh, uh, no threats, house. You screwed up and tried to be a good guy, and now you're suffering consequences. I'll send the package to your location right away. Don't open it, it's rigged to blow up without a proper code. Just drop it off in a marked spot and fuck off from there. Anyone spots you and asks you about it, you have no idea what they're talking about, savvy? Good. Tally-ho then, old boy. Been a pleasure talking to you again. Harper's face disappeared from the terminal, and normal bank software returned to the screen. House didn't see it, though, furiously swearing under his breath. He should have insisted on killing Martin after he extracted what information they wanted out of him, but maybe Mr. Cart's chill mindset was really getting to him. Still, there was no point for a second guessing or thinking what if right now. Harper held his leash now, so he had to look for a way to not only cut himself free again, but to remove her from the equation altogether. For now, though, he had to obey, so he waited for the package, punched the courier who delivered it and got back to the fleet, where he explained the situation to Mr. Cartz. His boss just sighed warily, like he used to do when he received bad news, but he didn't scold him. You are right, House, he said instead, angry at himself. Should have listened to you, and now we're all paying the price because I didn't. So let's do it right away, before we get back to Galatia, in case this package is more problematic than it looks like. 
And worry not, I have a friend who may help you out with that Harper woman. In the meantime, get everyone to stations, we're moving out. House did what was asked of him, quietly thankful that Mr. Carter decided to help. Then again, this blackmail could affect them all, so everyone had the exact same reason to make sure Harper didn't run to counter with her revelations. They were already on the radar of several governments. Adding the most dangerous and most deranged pirate world to the list would be a bit too much. Fortunately, the job wasn't all that difficult as House's old pirate friend painted it to be. As always, thanks to Mr. Kant's signature jammer. On their trip to and from the better maintenance system, an unremarkable and mostly empty space, they did indeed encounter several large fleets, seemingly on the lookout for them, but they had no hope of spotting them, neither in hyperspace nor in the asteroid belts of the better maintenance system, where the package was dropped. As for the package itself, House wanted to look inside of it, but Zala, resident explosive expert, confirmed Harper's words. This thing indeed had a bomb inside of it, one complicated enough to prevent any tampering. Zala was sure she could crack it open, but only in specific conditions on the surface of a planet, and they didn't have time for that. So instead, they dropped it off in the asteroid belt, evaded a bunch of bounty hunters and came back to the core, where, upon arriving, they received an automated message from Harper. It was short, smack to raid on how happy she was to find such a useful business partner. She added that she will be in touch, which meant more blackmail was sure to follow. Fortunately, her message came from a regular comma ray, which meant that Mr. Cart could seek midnight dissonant at it to find its source. It would probably take a while, and Harper no doubt used similar precautions as House, but it was the only thing they could do to ensure this woman wouldn't run them out. One day they'd have to find her and convince her to forget everything. And, as House said, dead people can't remember anything. But with this business done, it was finally time to get back to the Academy. But as Cart Logistics approached it, they were hailed from inside, but this time not by flight control operator or even their usual liaison Sebastian, but by Provost Anahita Baird herself. Finally, she shouted as soon as the connection was established. Where the hell were you all this time? Never mind, we have a job to do. Yes, we do. Mr. Kant said, slightly confused by this unexpectedly brief welcome. We have to offload this bullshit you sent us out there to collect. Bullshit that almost got us killed. Yes, sure, send the cargo drone to the station, we'll pick it up. Yes, but not before you pay what you promised for it. What? Oh, yes, of course. Sebastian? Sebastian! She shouted behind her. Judging by the noise, there were at least several people in the room with her all just as agitated as the provost. There you are. Pay the man. Throw in some extra for workplace dangers or whatever. Now please, can we get on with it? Do you have another crisis there, Madam Provost? Another student accidentally deleted reality? Mr. Card asked, but Anahita did not smile. Clearly, something far more important was happening. The only crisis we have is a crisis of faith, and not among us, but somewhere else. We got a call a few days ago from a renowned Tritakian scientist. She wants to defect and come to us, and we've been racking our brains on how to extract her without starting a war or getting hundreds of people needlessly killed. Well, good luck with that, the boss said, but Anahita pinned him with her stare. We have good luck, mister, because you showed up. This scientist is vital to our future projects, so I'm willing to offer you a very significant amount of credits if you go get her for us. How significant? 100,000, plus more dividends further down the line. You'd have to go to a system at the very edge of the sector, approach a seemingly uninhabited and inhospitable world without being detected by Tritech security, and get the researcher in question out of there. Simple, but not easy but I'm sure with your ability to fly below the radar you can manage it. I probably could, but I refuse. Great, then... Wait, what? The hell you mean you refuse? This is too important for you to get cold feet now. I don't have feet, Madam Provost, in case you don't remember, but we are done doing jobs for you in the dark. 
This last expedition almost got us killed. In fact, judging by the amount of destroyed starships around one of your probes, it killed a bunch of spaces already. And as much as I appreciate your money, I far more appreciate not dying in a stupid way. So either you will give us some answers as to what the hell is happening, or you can look for another fleet of losers to do your dirty job for you. The Provost lowered her voice and moved closer to the comm. For an old lady who wasn't even one and a half meter tall, she could look dreadfully intimidating if she wanted to. You are aware that I still know about your AI, and all I need to do is make a call and Hegemony Fleet will lock this entire system up and take it down. Good luck with that, Provost. You can do it, yes, but it will also put you and your entire academy in the spotlight. And judging by the fact you hired us, a random company of nobodies, to do your work, you want to avoid attention as well. I do not ask for you to bear all contents of your brain for me. Just ask what the hell that device we recovered was, the one that almost exploded near a sun. Tell us why you kept all this stuff hidden at the edges of the sector, and then... Well, then I'm going to need your biologists or geneticists or doctors for some unrelated help. The old woman on the screen weighed her options and, after a good minute of silence, sighed heavily. Her stern glare relaxed a bit, though one of her eyes was still twitching. Very well, you want to know, I'll tell you. We wouldn't be here in this position if not for you, so I guess you lot deserve that much. The device that almost killed you is a machine that stores and transfers energy. Far more energy than any conventional reactors can hold. That is why it was so close to the sun. It basically stored all the solar energy like a great battery for further use. But it's not easy to create a containment field this strong, so the circular computer you brought back was designed to eject excess energy should the battery become too unstable. Judging by your descriptions, it looks like we need to remake these things from scratch, because it doesn't seem to be able to store even remotely as much energy as we need. And as for why it was so far away, clearly you saw what it could do when it vented its excess power. If we placed it closer to the core systems, we'd have casualties in tens of thousands. So, does that mean we brought back a failed experiment? Not entirely. The machine works, it just needs to do its job better, so we have to find a way to upgrade it. Something that, I hope, our new Tritachian friend can help us with. And as for this device attracting hyperspace anomalies, I have no clue what to say. We never recorded anything like that in the past. Then again, this machine was designed by the previous provost, Calicor, and knowing him, he may have hidden or misplaced some official documentation. We will check it out. But I wonder, you mentioned something about asking medics or biologists for help. But since we didn't have anything organic to recover out there, I'm guessing you found something else. Am I correct? Mr. Cart went quiet for a moment. The topic of clones they recovered, and what to do with them, was discussed a lot in the fleet over the past few weeks, and the boss, in a rare bout of democratic thought, decided to listen to opinions of his officers and vote together with them. Varuna was, obviously, against releasing this knowledge anywhere. Being a clone herself, she didn't expect other people, even scholars of the Academy, to treat them with any respect and, in fact, expected even more horrendous experiments. Captain House didn't really care about colonizer clones, but he, perhaps unwittingly, was doing a good job trying to break through conditioning of military ones. He and his crewmates were so disappointed in their line infantry approach to combat that they started randomly ambushing them in the dark corridors of their ships. They'd throw a bucket of paint here, a few screws there, and though initially reluctant, soldier clones were slowly coming around to this idea of new, unorthodox training. Then again, every time they caught one of House's pranksters, they never responded with violence, always saying that their training forbids harming human beings. Most people ignored that, but some picked up a rather troubling implication. If these troopers were not trained to fight humans, then who they were designed to kill? The clones themselves only said enemies of the domain and left it at that, and so weirdness remained. For Zala and her less conservative ludics, the new crewmates were a great theological mystery. 
The prophets said that beings like these are soulless abominations and should be purified in flames, but it was not the clones for that they were made. If anything, their creators were the soulless ones. But even if there was no spirituality in them, Zala and her cabal believed that they could create it. It would be, as she said, the ultimate triumph of human soul, to create one in a being that did not have it before. As such, she claimed that it would be best to ask for any help to fix the decomposing colonizer clones, before they turn into mush without experiencing even a single spiritual thought. Brother Jesselton and more conservative Ludix, on the other hand, were of course opposed and demanded regularly for their new crewmates to be thrown out of the airlock, which is why they were now separated in a few smaller ships at the back of the fleet, with only Jesselton remaining on his post on Mr. Khan's flagship. Needless to say, they were not too happy about it. Herr Ludwig agreed that help should be indeed found, but not here. Instead, he wanted to hand over the clones to Tritachian corporations, since they were the only ones with tech to manufacture them. And if they had tech to make clones, they could probably maintain them as well. But he was lonely in his opinion, and so everyone ignored him. And finally, Dr. Disco wanted to help his new patients himself, and was already performing some simple procedures and operations on them, but reluctantly agreed that he'd need far better equipment to figure out how to stop clones' rapid decay, and so he too agreed to ask the Academy for help. And so, Mr. Cart told the Provost everything, how and where they found these clones, and how their biology functioned, at least as far as they could tell. Anahita listened to this tirade with wide eyes, clearly excited to hear it. Of course, we can try and help them, she said after Mr. Cart finished his story and asked for help. But we'd have to perform some checkups and procedures on them. Our geneticists may be good, but they can't work remotely. Varuna shook her head when she heard that. She expected something like that, but her boss decided to take her side on that. I'm aware, which is why I'm also sending you a small container full of biological samples from these clones." He stared at the provost as if challenging her to complain. You gave us some scraps of knowledge, we give you some scraps in return. I'm sure your people can find a ton of stuff in there anyway, and once I know we can trust you, we can exchange more than samples. Deal? Deal, Anahita muttered, but her eyes were cold again. Clearly, though, she was excited to take a look even at the samples themselves. Who knows what mysteries these ancient clones held. But I can only assume we can trust you in return. Of course, Madam Provost. Send coordinates of the system where this Tritag defector is, and we'll get her out. Sending it now? Just be careful out there, Mr. Cart. I believe that they will not let her go easily. I expect nothing less from Trisakian. Now, we'll be back as soon as she's safe with us. And thank you for being so forthcoming, Madam Provost. Pleasure, she said and turned off the comm. Then she turned around to the quiet group of academicians behind her. So, Sebastian, you heard that conversation, didn't you? Was there something odd there that caught your attention? Um, yes, madam. I mean, every time we talk with this creature it is odd, but I guess… I think the clones are the weird part. We have here the largest collection of historical records from old domain times, and not a single one of them mentions even a single word about any clones. Precisely. So I wonder, is he lying to us, or does he know something we don't? Which option would be worse one, madam? Both, Sebastian. Both. Both, boss. Both options are bad, Varuna said a few hours later, during officer meeting. If this defector is trying to lure us into a trap, then we can only assume Tritakian will know we're coming, and even there at the edge of the sector, they can master a lot more firepower than we could. But if we assume this researcher really wants to leave, then it may be even worse. The company has this contract everyone has to sign, which basically says all intellectual property, literally every thought you have, belongs to them. So, we help her escape, and we find ourselves in the crosshairs of their content protection team, and they're more relentless than remnant machines. 
which is precisely why you're the one in charge of this operation, Mr. Katz said, not very happy about the odds. But Varuna not only worked for Tritakin for years, she also spent decades avoiding their sniffing dogs, and so came up with a relatively straightforward plan, which relied on the fleet not being detected. Something it was really good at. Additionally, the Academy provided a set of encryption keys to contact the defector, claiming they could possibly aid in their own escape. But Faruna didn't really like that idea, so she decided to only use them if there was no other option. But at this point, their plan lacked one major piece of information, namely, knowledge of the facility they were about to rescue the rogue scientist from. So until they made their way all the way to the very edge of Persian Sector, they couldn't really plan much else. So, they simply began with step one, fuel. Even a small fleet like Cart Logistics needed an absolute ton of antimatter pellets to reach such a distant system, and come back to the core without running dry along the way. Unfortunately, large quantities of fuel were almost always either very difficult or very expensive to acquire, with some exceptions. Hegemony World of Nachiketa had the largest refinery in the sector, and not all of refinery foremen and managers were dedicated to unquestioning service of their country, and eagerly sold some of their product on the side. So that's where the company went, to buy some cheap fuel right under High Hegemon's noses. But the High Hegemon was on the warpath. Patrols and pickets were flying everywhere, and even large battle groups were deployed around important worlds. When Cat Logistics was away on their mission, tensions in the core systems rose up once again, as Hegemony and Tritachion were at each other's throats over some industrial sabotage. Fortunately, sneaking around became pretty much a second nature of Cart Company, so they managed to reach Nashiketa with no issues. Though it took a few more days than it usually should, a clear sign that things were becoming a lot more heated. Once the fleet slid into an old, seemingly abandoned dock, getting in touch with black market fuel merchants was not much of an issue, but while fleet officers were at it, Varuna found something interesting. Through her old hegemony contacts, she learned that the Admiralty has posted a contract to locate an abandoned vessel. Jobs like that popped up all the time on various bulletin boards, and so were nothing unusual. But according to this particular contract, this abandoned ship was in a pair system, which was the exact same location Galatian Academy sent them to. This could have been a coincidence, of course. But Varuna was sure Hegemony had its eyes peeled for Tritachian secret activity there, and probably just wanted to use this opportunity to send someone to that system to look around without bearing official insignia of their navy. And, after a quick talk with her boss, Varuna decided to accept this contract. Not only it was on the way and paid rather well for such a seemingly easy job, it would also allow Cart Logistics to maybe gain some measure of goodwill from the largest state in the sector. Of course, they didn't accept the job under their own name, but everyone knew how word travelled around. Varuna's old navy friends knew who to whisper the truth to, to make sure important people were aware who really helped them out. But, with fuel purchased and contract accepted, it was time for step two, getting to the edges of the sector, preferably without Broadcasting's company presence along the way. This wasn't problematic either. Most fleets in hyperspace just powered straight towards their destination, without caring about anything else. Human beings really didn't enjoy being away from reality for long, so it was no problem to sneak out of the core and set a course for pair system. But along the way, an old friend appeared on the horizon. A few days away from the core, a familiar, fast-moving signature showed up on the sensors and quickly began orbiting the fleet. Except this time, Mr. Carl decided to not wait for their usual welcome. Instead, he ordered every vessel to fire an interdiction pulse as soon as the signature was in range, and moments later it was running away, as if shocked and offended by this hostile reception, its retreat hounded by jeers of the crew. It was odd how quickly these mysterious hyperspace anomalies became hyperspace annoyances in heads of fleet's crew members.
But while his men howled and hollered at the running sensor signature, Mr. Card and a handful of people wondered if this won't have some serious repercussions further down the line. And then came step three, entering the pair system. But despite all things that could go wrong while entering a hostile territory, sneaking into this Tritachion controlled system proved to be easier than anyone expected, thanks to a fair bit of good old fashioned luck. When the fleet arrived at the edge of the sector, assuming entry points closer to the core were better protected, they spotted another signature on their screens. But it was not a ghost, nor a Tritech patrol. It was, instead, a small fleet of scavengers, the kind you could find pretty much anywhere in the sector. And they seemed to have the same idea as Cart Logistics, and entered the system through the farthest, most distant jump point. All that the company had to do now was to wait about an hour and follow them, and as they jumped into the gravity well, they saw exactly what they expected. There was indeed a Tritachian patrol, or, to be more precise, an entire defensive fleet, posted near the entry. But now, that fleet was busy trying to catch the scavengers, which allowed Cart Logistics to sneak past both of them and move deeper into the system. Hopefully, the scavs managed to get away, but aside from wishful thinking, there was nothing anyone else could do for them. Over the next few days, the fleet quietly flew across the system, and once they got closer to the local star, a massive blue giant, their sensors picked up an entire debris field of old battered ships, one of which was the one that Hegemony wanted them to scan. It was a relatively simple job, just get close enough to the vessel and ping it with a prepared comm frequency. Except two things were not exactly right. First, as soon as the ship was scanned, it emitted a faint pause of its own, almost as if it wasn't as dead as everyone expected. And second, that vessels and all others in the area were stuck inside a solar flare, which should have blasted them far away from the sun. And yet, somehow they stayed on the spot, as if anchored to something invisible. Mr. Card decided that an opportunity like that shouldn't just be ignored, though, and spent next three days sending salvagers to bring anything of value from these vessels, some of which were indeed as old as they seemed, but some seemed a lot newer, maybe built even a few years or decades ago. Still, not much cargo was found there, and, oddly enough, nothing weird was found inside the ship Hegemony Scan originated from. But, with another job on their hands, the company decided to leave this mystery behind and move on to rescue the defector. But as they reached the planet she was stationed on, a quick scan showed up that this wouldn't be an easy job. The facility on the surface wasn't as small as everyone expected. If anything, it was a massive complex of buildings carved into the surface of the world itself and both around it and in the middle of it were ground defences, imposing enough that a fleet of battleships would have a problem taking them all on, let alone a tiny fleet of mostly cargo vessels like Cart Logistics was. Varuna and others spent another day looking at the scans, racking their brains and trying to find some way inside, but whatever this complex was, Tritachion protected it about as much as they protected their own capital city back in the core. Guests were clearly not welcome, so, after coming blank with ideas, Mr. Card decided to try their next and final option, and sent out an encrypted message, hoping the defector would answer them. An answer she did. Mere seconds later, a distorted face of a pale, redhead woman appeared on the screen. She was sweating bullets and could barely breathe. Hello, you my extraction team? she asked without introductions. Her eyes were darting from side to side as if expecting trouble. Yes, we're here to pick you up, miss, Mr. Katz said. If this woman was trying to bathe them out, she was playing her role very well. Good. Grant. Because they learned I want to leave. Been hiding on them for the past day, but I can't dodge them forever. You in orbit? Please tell me you're in orbit. Mr. Katz nodded, and the woman replied with hysterical giggle. Great. Then don't come down, they have a ton of stealth satellites scanning everything, and missiles, lots of missiles. So I'm coming up to you, pick me up once I'm up there. 
and with that she shut off the comm, leaving everyone who listened to this call confused. But mere minute later, the sensors picked up a massive explosion on the surface. An entire wing of the massive complex disappeared in a fireball, and local comm channels erupted with activity. Everyone was asking what the hell was going on, and organizing rescue operations. And, in the middle of it, a small, open cargo pod launched from the base. It was not something a sane person would use to fly into space. The pod was basically an open engine, and soon the sensors picked up the figure of a woman strapped haphazardly onto it. Fortunately, the world barely had any atmosphere, or it would rip her to shreds on the ascent. For a brief moment, the pod vanished from the sensors as a massive scampel sweeped the entire system. Tritakian knew what was going on, and they would not let their researcher leave. And there she was again. Just as quickly as she appeared, her pod climbed the orbit and rushed towards the fleet, and then slammed directly into CLS Second Chance. The away rescue crew rushed to the airlock, expecting to find their researcher turned into nothing but fine red paste, but as they opened the doors she was already there, a wild, hounded look in her eyes. One of her legs was twisted in a way no human leg should bend, but clearly adrenaline was keeping the pain down. She pushed through the rescuers and collapsed in the airlock, catching her breath. Problem? She finally said, barely audible through her helmet. Varuna ran up to her and helped her take it off. Sensors picked me up. They know where I went. Everyone stared at each other in response. These were not good news, and Varuna knew that most of all. She knelt near the woman and said, Miss Focus, did you sign the contract with the content protection team? The woman just nodded, and Varuna rushed to her boss's cabin as alerts started blaring across all fleet. Boss, they're not letting her go! They're gonna try and delete her before she leaves! She shouted as soon as she entered the room. Mr. Carr was already at the console, pointing at the sensors. I know, they launched an entire volley of anti-ship missiles. They're going to lock onto us in about ten minutes. Can we escape them? Nope. They're too fast, and even our jammer won't help if they get too close. They only have to get lucky once. So, what, we're dead? Yes, unless I remember how to do this old trick, her boss replied, and as he did so, all the cables hanging from the ceiling connected to his suit. Weird chemicals were pumped along them, and Mr. Card's visor started glowing like a small star. Ah, and this is precisely why those implants are so fucking expensive, he said through gritted teeth, clearly in pain. Varuna took a step back. What the hell are you doing, boss? Something I was trained to do long ago. You know that basic rule of interstellar physics that says that you can only enter hyperspace at certain points? Well, we're about to break it. Varuna didn't understand at first, but then she looked at the screens and saw what was happening outside of the ship on external cameras. She opened her mouth to shout, but no sound came out and everything collapsed into darkness.